James, as I said at the beginning, man, super pleasure to be here with you. Really special to witness your journey. You know, as a schoolboy rugby player who grew up and watched your path, but then also to really kind of watch the hero's journey at play as well, real time to witness the comeback. It's just incredibly special, man. And I really just want to say, like, I feel proud watching your journey because I know, you know, I've only seen the outside of it, but the inner world would have just been a completely different journey, man. So I'm excited to spend time with you today. And thanks so much for carving some time out of your schedule. Yeah, appreciate it. Happy to be here. Nice, dude. So some of our listeners would be very familiar with you. Um, some of them maybe down uh, in the uh, AFL states uh, wouldn't be as familiar. Would you be able to just give a really quick background in however long you need just on your personal life story? Who was James O'Connor in, a, in right. a couple of minutes? Yeah. In a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, so I grew up on the Gold Coast um, when I was about 15 years old. I moved to Nudgee College, the big school in Brisbane, big rugby school. So I was playing rugby league, swapped to Union. Um, I think that was a sort of a crew time, like crew moment, uh, crucial moment in my life, uh, making that swap and going to boarding school. I uh, yeah, I learned a lot there and also um, just was given a lot of freedom. So I started uh, at a young age, almost like pushing the boundaries a little bit, having a little play there. Nothing like malice or anything but um yeah i was really enjoying myself and then they had just 17 i got a contract with western force so i moved over to perth and played with that journey um i was loving it just soaking everything up it was uh yeah an amazing time in my life lived with about four guys four of my best mates on the beach there and played rugby enjoyed ourselves off the field it was uh yeah a beautiful time in my life and then moved to probably another big decision of mine was moving to melbourne um which was possibly looking back that was where sort of things started to, to turn a little bit I love expressing myself sort of away from footy like going to the beach I enjoy anything in the water doing little activities and in Melbourne I found it was sort of all about the scene a little bit um lurking on Chapel Street a lot all of that hipsters sort of, down there man yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, I was just sort of I didn't really even leave my area so I had a place in, on Chapel Street there and we just literally stuck stuck to our little crew stuck in that area so I, I feel like I wasn't feeding that um, that expressive expressive side of myself, and then had a couple injuries, um, and then started. Uh, I guess I started drinking and dabbling with uh, certain substances that uh, led to me just becoming a little bit weaker, and um, started making some poor decisions um, off the field. Just oh, I was uh, I was being treated like a man, but I was still a, like I was still mm. a boy. I hadn't actually transitioned into that sort of that mindset. Like uh, I'd been given everything. I've been given everything to destroy myself pretty much. Any door I wanted, I could open with the help of a few of my friends as well. Um, so yeah, then I eventually had to leave Australia. Um, I didn't have to leave, but sort of my contract was sort of not torn up, but it was like, hey, you're going to get half of what we're offering now and you got to go do this and you got to see a psychiatrist and blah, 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 which I was actually already seeing a, um, a few people at that time, but I decided to just go overseas and have a fresh fresh start. So I went to London first and pretty much just partied there. Went to um, France, played for Toulon, and I really tried to put my head down and um, focus on rugby and enjoy myself. And it was it was a, a beautiful time in my life, but then lines started to get blurred again because I hadn't done any internal work. I'd sort of just run away from my issues. They, uh, as you know, sort of they they popped back up and then they came back tenfold. Um, had a, had a few seizures actually from um, just yeah what I was yeah drinking too much and etc and uh knew i had to make some changes but didn't know how like uh there was i had some good people around me um but i was just so like i was very stubborn and thought i you know i knew the way forward and i could get myself out of it and eventually i came to a place where i realized Fuck, I, yeah i can't i don't know what to do I, I can't seem to beat this you know i was depressed anxious there was times where you know i wouldn't get out of bed for like a couple of days and getting up for training was hard and i was always just tinkering on pretty much just um self-medicating myself with whatever i could find to literally get through get mm. through the day get through the week um i was never sort of at a suicidal sort of place but i was at a place where i just i wanted to i wanted to disappear i wanted to move to an island take all my cash and just live from an island and just get away from the pressure but it was pressure that i put on myself as well it was pretty much all coming from the internal uh eventually i i got in quite a bit of trouble i um Got done with a, a friend of mine for doing cocaine in uh, in in Paris, and um, yeah, it was uh, it was a tough time. That mm. uh, was put in uh, like a, a prison cell for uh, three days. Um, 
but it wasn't like lock up in Australia, which I've been in as well. It was uh, proper heavy. Like felt like I was in a medieval dungeon. Mm. It was uh, guys smearing shit all over the walls, people just screaming the whole time. And I was just, that's where probably was my rock bottom where I was like, well, my rugby career is over. And uh, what, what am I doing with my life? Like, what is, what am I actually doing here? I'm not enjoying this at all. Um, so why don't I quit? And like, I, I was injured. I kept getting injured. I'd be on the field for two weeks and I'd be off the field for two weeks. I just couldn't get myself straightened out. And then made the decision to leave France and move to the UK. And that's where I met um, a guy, the guy from Save Your World. And yeah, that's sort of where the, the return journey started. He had rebuild my body physically first. And then we started uh, working on my mind and um, I guess my spirit as well. And uh, refound my purpose um, and realized that I had run away from everything in my life. Anything that meant anything to me, I'd sort of pretended it didn't. Um, mm. And yeah, I was just afraid to feel to feel that was it. I was scared of, of feeling. Um, but yeah, we, we worked through that and I started rebuilding myself and I got to a place where I could put my hand up and say, look, I want to get back to Australia. Part of the reason why I'm you know, so depressed is because I'm looking on and watching everyone else back home and I'm saying, that should be me. Like, why am I too weak to, you know, stay on the path? And then as soon as I stopped making things like wrong or right and just took it day by day, because you realize like every time you make something wrong, you put yourself in another hole, you get guilt, you get shame. And it's like, just make a decision in that moment to recommit, which I started doing. And then I ended up coming back to Australia. And to be honest, it was still quite a bit of fear. Like I had a, a belief in myself, but I hadn't played at that top level for a while. I was coming back into the bubble, t into the Australian sort of media where I'd been scrutinized a lot and where there was, I guess, a, there's a lot of pressure on sportsmen, whereas overseas, no one really cares as actors and musicians and sort of you're a small fish there. So I really, yeah, was like, hey, I'm, I'm ready for this. I'm going to put my hand up and like, yeah, it's time to come home. So I came home and like, I uh, don't know whether it's luck or whether it was, you know, the universe, but uh, I had quite a quite a straightforward path back into the Wallabies. A few guys got injured. Uh, Marika had a child, so I ended up sliding. I had two days to impress to get on a, a South African tour. And, geez, if there's a guy that goes 110% at training, I was going 150. The boys were probably looking at me like, this bloke, what is he? <laughs> like, what a loser. <laughs> but I was going hard and everything and ended up making the South African tour and just uh, worked my way back into the team and then worked my way into the starting squad and played in the World Cup and... That was probably another little milestone where I got to the World Cup and I thought it would bring me so much joy and mm -hmm. happiness and like, hey, I've done it. But it was the opposite. It was like, like not not like what's next, but it's like, hey, stop living for the outcome. You know, there's no big moment that you're going to be like, hey, I've made it now. I'm all good. That was almost like, okay, back to the drawing board and why am I actually playing rugby? Because at the start when I was working with the guy from Save Your World, it was all about, I'd been depressed, I'd been in pain, and I wanted to show that you can get out of that and just show that, you know, there is a way for men to communicate and to be able to dig themselves out of a hole. So that was the first step. But then I got back and I'd done that and it was like, okay, I'm no longer playing for that because I'm not in that state. So what is it that I'm playing for? And then, uh, yeah, I just started building building on that, um, re, I guess refound my uh, my identity again on, on, a, on a further level. And... Um, yeah, the rest is sort of history. I've really enjoyed being back home and just taking it day by day and started with the Reds, a new group, young guys, and just trying to, I guess, guide them through without guiding them through, you know, just be, I guess, a beacon for it, lead to my actions and then uh, ended up ended up moving to the 10 position, which was something that I'd sort of dreamt about for a long time, but I hadn't faced because I had a, uh, had a tough go when I was younger at 10. Um, and got scrutinized, so I sort of hid from it and just pretended I didn't want to play there anymore. Instead of doubling down and putting in the hard work, mm. as uh, as you can do, you, you run away from it. Um, so when I owned up to that, it's almost like another door was opened, another magic door, and a lot I was just attracting a lot more. And I found uh, I found a, a deep peace within myself because I was no longer sort of looking outside myself. I was just I was just literally content in my little inner world of. You know, my day-to-day -day things. It wasn't like I needed to go to a nightclub to feel happy or had to win a game to feel happy or, you know, I didn't need those same sort of pleasures. The pleasure came from just ticking along and being at peace and enjoying myself with my partner and, and my dog and whatnot and getting down into nature and 
I guess, moving on to the next chapter, which is, I guess, possibly we'll touch on that now. Mate, just to Sorry, reflect back intro. to you. No, <laughs> but just, I think, to reflect back to you how clean that felt, you know, and I think that's a reflection of your inner world right now. And that's not to say things are perfect, but just for, for you to deliver some pretty serious life events in the way that you just delivered it, it, it felt really clean. Mm. And my partner's a yoga teacher and she shared this brilliant quote with me that your energy introduces you before you speak. Yeah. And it's so true, man. I can just feel that right now. And I just want to say f- just for everything that you went through, you've earned who you are right now. You really earned it. Appreciate that, brother. Yeah, man. And because from the outside, people don't get it. They just wouldn't get it. And, you know, working in a professional industry where you very much a commodity as a, as, and your personality, your struggle, your story, your family story isn't heard, isn't recognized. It's like you become a name that people get to have an opinion about. Yeah. And that must be incredibly tough at times. Yeah, it was for sure. I think that was one of the, the key reasons why I lost myself. Because I, I was, I'm very good at sort of mixing and matching and I guess being able to adapt to my environment. But at the age of sort of 22, I was getting wheeled out to CEOs. So I'd put on this mask, you know, the clean cut version. Then I'd be put in this environment and I'd put on another mask and then another mask and then to adapt and like, because it works. And, mm. I, and, and I could, you know, engage with these people and I was getting all this credit and pats on the back and the money was coming in, but there was no fulfillment in it. And I remember... It was actually my dad who, like, who first mentioned. It. He's like, "Like, what are you doing? Like, mm. who are you?" And my partner as well, Bridget, was like, "Like, take, like, take the mind. Like, you're talking to me now. Like, I'm who? Like, what are we doing here?" And I, I lost who I was because I'd played the game for so long. I lost who James O'Connor was. I had become a footballer, a model, a, a this or that. The character. Yeah, the char- literally the character in the game. But it wasn't a character that I wanted to be. It was what I thought others wanted me to be. And there were so many of them. I think one of the other tough parts as well was I'd, I'd be told, like, you, know, you can't hang out with this guy or don't be doing that. or But then in the same breath, the organization was asking me to get these guys to come to the games and stuff like that because they had big profiles, etc. So I was, I was just getting conflicting ideas from everyone. And then... Cause I wanted to, like a part of me wants to make people happy. Like, uh, I feel like I, number one, a rugby player, like I'm an entertainer, but number two, I, I like bringing joy into people's lives. I feel that's a big part of who I am, but I found out now, like boundaries are huge and what's real, like me bringing joy from my real persona, from what is like, and to people who actually deserve it instead of me just playing this little fluff game and, you know, feeding you a bit of energy and then you go and destroy yourself with it. Yeah, absolutely, man. It it just makes me think, like, I want to touch on energy as well because I feel like already that's coming as a, a consistent theme. But, you know, what you put out to the world is what you attract internally too. And I think, you know, for you as a, you know, a kid who debuted at 17 mm-hmm. to then Wallabies at 18, like, you're still in child psychology. You might be an adolescent teenager, but your psychology is still very much a child. But you've got almost a smorgasbord of adult decisions in front of you. And you, you get rewarded for that too. And it's just like, what what do we expect? You know, giving it's like giving, you know, a kid a Lamborghini when they just get their L's. It's like, of course, you've got to test it around the corners. And as you did, coming back to you as that kind of young young man emerging into the world being surrounded by like some conflicting messages, what do you wish happened instead of, or what would have made a difference for you actually? Not wish, cause I think we were talking about yeah. before offline at all. It's all perfect now. Yeah. But what, what would have made a difference for you as a young gun coming through? That's a difficult thing mm. to say because I believe everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And these situations and circumstances led to where I am right now, which if I'd had just a clean cut career, I don't believe like my, my imprint on the world would be as big as it is now because I have been to the darkest of dark places. I've been to those low places. So now like these guys coming through, I can share some knowledge on that and I, I can spot it in guys straight away as well. I can see when someone's battling with themselves or they're not being authentic and they're not being true to themselves. But yeah, for me, it was, I was pretty like, it's pretty, pretty <laughs> public knowledge. I was, uh, I was quite stubborn, like uh, not in a, like a, an arrogant way, but just because I'd made it at such a young age from like from 15, I knew I was going to play professional, probably from 12. 
Yeah. I knew that whatever I set my mind to, if I put enough time and energy into it, I'll get it. There was like, there was no no. And was, was that for you from a family environment? Had, who imparted that type of wisdom on you or was it a deeper knowing for you? Well, my dad, for sure. Cool. He was a, well, my dad was a, back when I was growing up, was a minister in a, yeah, in a Christian church. So, and he imparted not religious views, but more so just spiritual views, almost like, you know, it's exactly like what you say you reap, like energetically, your internal reflects your external mm. as above. So below, like all these, I guess, almost like Gnostic teachings. And then underneath that as well, or over top of that was just that hard work and that drive. So he instilled a lot of that in me. And then I think my brothers played a big role as well. They, um, I, my older brother was very like physically yeah, gifted and uh, a sharp mind as well, intelligent guy. So I was competing with him constantly. It was like I was, yeah, I was constantly competing. Like if it wasn't for him, I would not be the player I am or have the the willpower I do. He literally instilled in me all these, yeah, great things and things as well that allowed me to destroy myself. Yeah. So there was, yeah, a couple influences um, in in that area. But yeah. I was going to say the mongrel, you know, yeah, the mongrel. Well, I was a middle child. The yeah. Mongrel, I was, yeah we, <laughs> we joke about it now because my younger brother as well. He's pretty stocky and yeah, he's pretty genetically blessed too and i was that the skinny mongrel kid in the middle who had to fight for his food yeah yeah so but like in, in you know a modern world of 20 2022 it's like the mongrel is a really important thing mm. and it, it often i think particularly yeah. a part of the masculine experience now is like the, very much the masculine experience has been sanitized mm. you know it's like some of the beautiful masculine traits around you know some days being really stoic some days having the mongrel and going after it is a really important thing to cultivate internally. But I think because we've been so exposed to so many men who have used their gifts for often very evil purposes, the the mongrel or the inner masculine or the king or the warrior gets kind of shoved to the side. And we suddenly we're starting to see society run by boys in man suits. Yeah. And it, it's it's sad to see the decisions that they're making from that state of psychology. So I think just to your point, like, my brothers and, and the mongrel was awesome. So massive shout out to your big bro for yeah, instilling I mean, that. Well, I feel you on that because the suppressed are always going to gonna rise up. And exactly what you said, there was men in powerful positions who abused it. You know, they had gifts and, and they abused it and rightfully so. It's, it's rebalancing out. But yeah, I feel you on that. I, I feel as well like masculinity is under attack in a way. Like we, we genuinely are. And um, some guys are afraid to just show how powerful they are too. They don't want to put their head out. Tall poppy, they'll get chopped down. But the big thing I like, I advocate as well is it's all about balance. Like you can be yang, you can be masculine as long as you're balanced with the femininity as well, like with your yin. But there's time, like we are men. We need, like we li literally genetically, that's what we've been, we've been given more testosterone for a reason to go out there. Like back in the day, we were warriors, you know. That's what we're here for. Yeah, and the, the, there's yeah. a saying, I think, that encapsulates this for me, talking about the integration of the masculine and the feminine is you don't give a sword to a man who can't dance. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And like that. and it's, it's exactly that, right? It's the integration that, like, this concept of being dangerous is worrying to some people because there have been so many men who have been really evil in the way that they're dangerous. But dangerous doesn't necessarily mean the actions are to a disservice of others, it, but it's, it's the protector, it's the provider. And that is a really important energy to cultivate. Yeah. The protector for sure. Yeah. And so I'm coming back to your dad having this, it's almost like he kind of set up the, the container of this, like almost like these universal truths mm. that it's like, you know, you follow your path, but there are some fundamental spiritual truths here that are at play that, you know, you have to maybe go on your own journey to test boundaries as I also did in, yeah. in my journey. But that's all perfect. If you can be a man that can take responsibility and accountability and integrity for who you are, then to your point, you lead by your deeds, not your words. Yeah. And I think that's really powerful to hear you talk about how you're now leading culturally inside the Reds. You don't need the banner of the captain or the armband. It actually comes back to who are you at training every day, day in, day out. And I think it's just really rare, man, to find people who are leading like that. Because we actually, if we talk about the state of the world right now, we don't have many leaders like that. 
We have a lot of men who are living out their trauma and expressing that on other people. And it's about power. And it's about control. It's about conquest. And it's about competition. It's not about service. It's not about love. It's not about community. It's not about being the role model. Yeah. And I think, man, it's just really powerful to see your journey at what, 31? Yeah, 31. 31, dude, to, to have kind of almost lived this, you, you know, we keep saying the hero's journey, but it really is. You've kind of set off on the call to adventure. You've had a challenge. You've then met a mentor. You've then gone into the depths and fought the dragon. You know, you've come back with the gold and you're returning that to the people. You know, that's the narrative which you'll find in most stories, but it is, you're really living that, man. And it's it's special. And there's this moment that stands out for me. I remember seeing on TV, I think it was your first game back for the Wallabies. And there was this shot and just seeing your eyes, seeing your eyes, like it was like you were just really present and you were really grateful to be be there at that moment. Yeah. I was like, man, I don't think I can say I've seen many men, let alone athletes, who can sit there in and hold that energy internally. Yeah. Because for me, it means you've gone places internally. Yeah, oh, 100%. I think I remember, I think I can recall what you're, mm. the moment you're talking about in Perth. But it was just, it was gratitude. Yeah. It was, and I feel like when I was younger, I, because everything was given to me, like I didn't have that that gratitude and the actual. So now that I've I've been to those places and come back, it was a uh, I'm just genuinely grateful for this experience. And I think beautiful thing you touched on before was you said that it's boys wearing men's clothing, and I 100% agree with that. But how do you become a man? That's the question. And for me, it was through hardship. It was through hitting rock bottom a few times. If you don't actually leave you know your little box or your little nest or whatnot how do you like we don't have an initiation like they did back in the day how do you become a man and that is an issue because there is it's boys a lot of yeah a lot of men aren't actually men it's boys running the show now and so how do we you know how do we transition for me it was i made a lot of errors to find my way and my path one of my mentors a guy called dr arnav rubenstein who lives out in byron bay has run rites of passage camps for 20 years with boys into manhood with their kind of adult male figures in their life. And he has this line that boy psychology is I am center of the universe. Yeah, me, ego, ego yeah. me, it's about me. Whereas healthy man psychology is I'm a part of the universe. Yeah. And yeah. for me, that just oneness, right? Yeah. And that that's exactly it. I'm part of something bigger. At the end of the day, I, I am just cosmic stardust, you yeah. know, he's ended up in this room yeah. right now having yeah. this conversation, which is, we might go there later, but, um, you know, I think that that healthy rite of passage into manhood is really missed. Yeah. And to your point, it's not like we're out in, you know, with the tribes, the Zulu tribes hunting the lion or, you know, in Vanuatu jumping from with the vines yeah, attached. With the vines, the bungee jumping, right. yeah. And the whole idea behind a, uh, a, a healthy rite of passage is that it tests our psyche. And the idea is that our psyche has to transition into a space where we're in that kind of challenge zone where it's really like flight or fight. And in that zone, we have to let go of old behaviors and discover something new and we test our mortality. And it sounds like from your yeah. experience, that's what happened. Yeah. There was something higher that was going on that was like, listen, if you're not going to self, you know, if you're not going to be in an initiatory experience where your elders are going to take you through it, we're going to help you find your own path there. Yeah. So yeah. it sounds like it, it manifested like that in a couple of different ways. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think like even those initiations you're talking about, like back in the day as well, like, you know, that uh, a kid when he was becoming a man, you know, they'd put him in the dark, make him stay outside for like away from the village for, you know, a night or two. And, you know, the elders in the village or the men in the village, you know, would put masks on and he'd have to face his fear and fight them. But yeah, you don't have that nowadays. Like we're not, I guess we're not facing our fear in the, in the same way. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we've, we've run camps like that out, you know, out in the bush behind Mullum where, you know, there's um, the, the father figures take the boys out in the bush and we say to the boys, we're going to leave you here overnight and we'll come back when you're ready. Yeah. And so they sit there and the boys don't know that we're sitting in the bush, yeah, you know, 50 course, years yeah. behind. Cause yeah. of course we're the, the healthy masculine is there, it's present, but the boys have to go through this journey themselves to kind of find out who they are. To know they can. Yeah. Exactly. Right. As soon as you, and that that was the thing as well. As soon as the veil is lifted and you realize it's not all about me, it's not about the I, it's about like the collective. Yeah. Everything, everything changed for me. Like my rugby started flourishing because I was no longer looking for myself in each moment. Like 
how can I look good? How can I make a break? How can I do that? And it's like, hey, I'm going to serve the team and it opens up. It's like when you serve as well, like when you're serving, you get energy back as well. And like, yeah, absolutely. Very interesting thing. Like as soon as you realize that we are like, it is all one and our job being men as well is to protect, is to, is to look at the collective. That's when everything else, well, then you can start feeding yourself even more. Absolutely, man. And I think the the important thing inside of that protect doesn't mean we're protecting because the feminine can't hold themselves or protect themselves. It's just we're here in support, in partnership, in union, which I think is really important. Um, I'm also really curious around like this work you've done with Savior World. Like it's, you know, the, it seems like when the student is ready, the, the master will appear, right? It it almost (laughs) seems like that, that happened for you. And you know, we, we live in a world right now where some of our bigger institutions where we used to learn our morals and our values and our, you know, higher spiritual truths are really crumbling. And because the power that's been involved with them has really corrupted. And so we're now starting to see, particularly in our work with a lot of young men, is they don't really have a diverse selection of role models. They yeah. don't have an understanding or connection to nature. It's something seen as other you know, it's not that connection that I, or actually that is me and I'm in harmony with the planet as much as I am with you. But I think there's starting to see this, like this, like little voice is starting to get louder in so many people, the intuition, the gut. I'm curious about how that's played a role for you in your journey. And, you know, we can start with Save Your World and, and the role that's played for you, I think. Yeah. So Save Your World came into my life at just the right time. Like it was divinely organized. That's the best way I can put it. And for me, it was, it was just literally dropping my ego. Like we spoke about that oneness. So first it was about rebuilding my body because I was, I was actually so ill. I don't know how I was playing professional rugby. Like I'd been, I lost my spleen when I was uh, 15. So I'd been taking penicillin twice a day. I was on anti-inflammatories every day. I was on painkillers. I was mixing it with alcohol like every now because I just wanted to, to dull myself. So we had to just clean my body up first. Because I I was just injured. If you're like you, as you know, if your gut isn't right, that's your first brain. Yeah. So I was already in trauma. Like I had so much cortisol levels, inflammation. My adrenals weren't firing properly. So we healed my physical body, and then it was just about finding my purpose. It's not like right or wrong or morals or whatnot. It's like like what am I actually here to do? What do I want to do? And if you go inside and you spend enough time on your own, you'll be directed. You'll hear that voice in terms of what exactly you want to do. So with Savior World was, yeah, so important for me because the guy, my point of contact there, Ollie, he just had such willpower, like, that I'd never seen before. Like, and it, he just, we felt like when he was behind you, like, you could fly. Like, he literally just would back you to the hills and just fed me and fed me and fed me when I ne- needed it energetically. Like, I'd jump onto the phone for him, to him for, like, an hour and a half every day when we first started working together, and he just fed me and fed me and fed me until I got to the point where I could start doing it for myself. And so that was so important for me. And then, and then there's a transition to get away from that, which is probably even bigger in itself because you can come so reliant on someone else. And at the end of the day, it's like, you're your own person. You, these are decisions you need to make for yourself and feel out for yourself. So then it was about leaving that, you know, savior and, you know, victim sort of mentality and doing it on your own, which can be scary as well when, you know, take the training wheels off. But like, once again, it's day by day and you're feeling them out and don't get too, don't be too hard on yourself. Mm. Like by all means, my life isn't perfect. I make errors every day, but I don't call them errors. It's just learnings. And it's like, okay, well I'll adapt differently next time and I'll, I'll play with it differently. I guess that sort of leads into where I am now in my world. And I've just bought a property with some friends of mine, um, out, out in Yukai. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's pretty awesome. I'm pretty stoked about it. And planning on running some retreats out there and, and yeah, all sorts to be able to, you know, rebuild the body, but also just for people to go internal and spend some time on themselves. And there's no better place than in nature. I know you mentioned before about the mongrel, like it's not like kids these days are given things so easy. Well, us as well. It's so easy to just sit on the couch and order this, order that, watch this, mind rot. Literally you're just feeding, you're constantly feeding that, that sloppiness, that, that side of you that just wants more. It's that ego as well, like me, entitlement, that, fast, that. We don't actually, like, you know, work hard for things anymore. You know, we might work hard for two weeks, but it's, it's that constant, literally, like, 
for me, the way I see it is it's not about putting all your energy for two weeks into something or like a preseason, six weeks, and I'm going to be a new man. It's like, no, no, I'm, I'm improving every day. Yeah, there'll be a few downward things, but if I literally collectively am always moving forward just in small increments, then I'll, I'll keep flourishing and I'll, and I'll find new and exciting things and you start attracting more and more to you. It's funny, when you stop looking for things, more things come because whatever you want to call it, God, the universe, yeah, whatever, literally whatever you want to call it, atoms vibrating, it's, if you have the right intention, because every, like, everything is about intention, if you're putting out the right intention, there's consciousness there and it will pick up on that and it will reward you for it because you're, you're going to give and you're going to give back to, to the world you're creating. Man, there was a lot in that, a lot of wisdom. And I think the thing for me inside of that is this, this element of like the intelligence of the higher consciousness. It's like we can't explain it with our little kind of peanut yeah, two million like year old mind, mind trying to, it's not meant to, trying right? to it's understand. Like computer. Exactly yeah. right. But coming back to your point, the, the gut has a deeper understanding than what the mind does. Mm. The, you know, And our species for however long we've been here have most of that time lived in harmony with the planet. Yeah. And it's only a very, very recent thing in the spectrum of like development of humanity that we've been so detached that we look to outsource our responsibility or our entertainment into a device. And, and I think at some point we need to take some responsibility for this because what we're starting to see is the metaverse, yeah, you know, which yeah. is this like pleasure driven yeah. reality, like, yeah. I, I, like a- augmented reality that, is so seductive that we have the best brains in the world working on pulling our attention in there, which is just so wild. When the irony is we actually have the metaverse in our head. We've got it all. We've got it. Now I find that I watched the Joe Rogan yeah. podcast uh, recently and I, I don't know who the guest on there was, but they were talking about NFTs and Joe Rogan's just like, like, man, why would I do that? They're like, well, you know, global warming and like, you're going to want to be in the metaverse. Like that's where you're going to want to live day by day. And I'm like, and he's like, that's not for me. I'm like, that's definitely not for me. I'm like, it just seems like the illusion, like, Hey, we have a world here right now that if we, yeah, if we turn a few things around, it could be heaven on earth, let alone now we're being guided into this virtual reality where it's just, we're just going to be feeding ourselves. You know, it's like watching that movie surrogates put your headphones on and your, your little goggles on and you go and live in that reality. Like, oh man. I know. And then where do we go from there? Do we create another reality inside of that reality yeah, and it's yeah. just the endless the simulation? Living, like, yeah, was it Elon Musk who yeah, said, yeah, exactly. are we living in a simulation right now? I know. And it's, you know, we're, we're, it's such an interesting time where, you know, I think it's really healthy that we're having these conversations and not just kind of going with the pack because I think, you know, we, we have to start thinking like this as as species because of what is going on in the world right now, whether mm. it's climate change, whether it's a world, potentially a world war, yeah. whether it's how we treat the marginalized people in our communities. It's like male mental health. It's like the list goes on. Like what more evidence do we need that we need to really slow yeah. down and have a look at how we're showing up? Yeah. So mate, back to, to Ollie and, and Save Your World. How did that come about? So you're living your journey. You're kind of having this path of like kind of up and down, up and down. How did Ollie come into your life? Just, I met him through a friend of a friend of mine mm. and uh, started, tried to work with him previously, but he'd turned me down. He was like, yeah, you, like, you're going to waste my time. You're not ready. Like, come to me when you're ready, which um, I was hurt when he said that at first, but it was, it was the truth because I wasn't ready. I would have just, like I'd, bull- like, I'd seen psychologists, psychiatrists and whatnot, and I felt like I could bullshit them and they could, they would believe what I was saying. And I was like, you're meant to be like a professional in this industry and like how am I like outmaneuvering you with my mind? Like and, and also that had been your narrative is the kind of you've got the whatever gifts you've yeah. been given, you can kind of work it out. Sometimes yeah. it's magic, you know. Yeah, and then yeah, to suddenly not they're get putting this or press this button yeah, or come yeah, through yeah. the back door there. Which is a gift, right? And let, let's yeah. not make that wrong, because I think the social intelligence inside of that to be the chameleon or to work out, you know, how to charm or there's a time and place for time it. And place, for sure. right? Yeah, yeah. For sure. It's when you yeah. When you lose track of who you actually are, that's when that's right. things get a, a little little heavier. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, to your point, what you said earlier about, you know, with your partner as well, like coming home and her going, hey, you don't have to perform for me. Yeah. Like, I know who you are, but then when there's so many masks on. So what did you learn from Ollie saying no? What did I learn from him saying, well, at the time, I was like, oh, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> but, what, yeah, what I eventually learned was yeah. like, and it probably goes into – 
unless you are willing to help yourself, no one can help you. You can literally see the brightest minds in the world. You can you can be around anyone, like you can be around people who are succeeding and whatnot. But if, unless you want to make change, unless you want to do it, it won't like it won't happen. And I've found that as well with people that I've mentored and I um, did a little bit of work out at Wacol at the prison out there and was working with some of the younger kids. And you could just see from the beginning the guys who literally were showing up. It was just it was maybe like two degree difference. They were the guys that went through and left and are doing really well. And other guys as well, like you could see, like I can I can read lip service, like when it's you know I've got a good bullshit radar because I am was bullshit, <laughs> you know. So I can like I can see through it now, but it, it's just crazy the mm. difference. Like, it's such a micro difference, but unless you choose it, then like there's no there's no point in it. And eventually, when I really chose it, when I was desperate enough to be like, hey, I need help now, like, mm. bro, like brother help me that's when you know we started working together and yeah and it, and it started small like it started small and he opened my eyes to a whole different reality like like yeah mm. energy the universe like i'd grown up in a in a christian family believing in believing in god uh, like a higher energy higher form um but this took it to a whole new level like even what science has been able to do now like proving that you know atoms vibrating at a certain frequency and consciousness is alive without something viewing it yeah. there is no the split experiment yeah, yeah literally so opened my eyes to that and then once i could see it actually translating into my world into my life like physically things happened i started manifesting things because i was literally had the right intention and was putting all my will into it not going after not chasing something for you know for my personal gain obviously like it's a personal game me trying to get back and play rugby for australia but my intention was pure in coming home. It wasn't, you know, to get more money or to be seen as like the rock star again, to, you know, to dye my hair blonde again and try to be a pinup boy or, or whatnot. It was, I wanted to come back one for the purity of the craft. I genuinely was loving my rugby again. So I wanted to showcase it and, and give, I guess, Queensland and my home the best version of myself. Mm. Cause when I came last time I was half the man, a quarter of the man I am now. So I really wanted to just, you know, sh share some, Spread some light and just, um, well, I know from my point of view, from when I was away and when I was broken, there was different sportsmen and different different people who really just fed me from watching them. Mm. I watched them play on the field and they just had so much joy in them or they, they would go so hard and they'd put their body on the line and they would give it, give it all. And, you know, you're watching that and you, it's inspiring. And I realized, hey, like, I'm, I can use that as my platform. I'm, awesome. you know, I'm gifted enough to be there. I've been there before. I can go back there and do it again. And, why not be the guy that people can just trust in? You know, like it's a beautiful thing when you can actually just trust someone to like go out there every week and perform. I know it's just a game of rugby, but you can buy into that and be like, hey, this guy here, he always puts his, you know, he puts his heart on the line. And I know that when he goes out there, he'll be solid. Not be the magician and throw a couple like some the ten, flick, pass, yeah, yeah. flick passes or a chip and chase or whatever, but playing the team game and just being solid. And I felt the more I was solid in my rugby, the more I was solid off the field. Or mm. well, the more I was balanced off the field, the more, you know, my yeah, rugby yeah. started, you know. To flourish. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Who were some of those people that you looked at that you took inspiration from? Oh, from all sort of sports. Um, mm. I, I actually started watching a lot of Kobe. Yeah. Like a lot of Kobe Bryant. He was, um, yeah, yeah very, very inspiring. But even like in football, like Ronaldo and Messi, sort of these sort of guys, like I'm, I'm watching them on the field and they're, they're always smiling. They're always like, mm. they can have like within the seriousness of like, this is a game on the line. They can have those internal jokes because they're genuinely just enjoying it and they're playing the game. I actually um, listened to a podcast last year with Johnny Wilkinson and it was one of like, it opened my eyes to a whole different level of like a different, even a, a, a layer deeper than what I had experienced before. And the main message I got from that amongst a hundred different messages was he was like just being present and having no like outcome planned. He's like, he said, he's, he remembers coaches being like, Johnny, like, are we going to win? Are we good enough? And he's like, eventually got to the stage in his career. He's like, I don't know. Like, and coach would be like, well, he's like, don't put your fear onto me. Like we've prepared. Now let's just see what happens. Like let's respond to the situation. You know, it's a beautiful thing when you don't know what the opposition's going to do. Isn't that why we're playing the game? Mm -hmm. To compete against each other. So I go out there now. I remember that inspired me. I was like, mm. why am I like, why am I trying to control things? I'm actually best when 
in the chaos because I can be calm. I can really be calm in that chaos because I don't have to hold on to an outcome. Like we must score, we must win this game. It's like whatever comes my way, I'll respond to and I'll, I'll play with it because I genuinely love playing and I'm excited to see what their mind is going to do, what the opposite 10 is going to do, what their coach has created, what sort of moves they're playing. And I can, <laughs> we played the Crusaders last year. I was watching them. I just, they, were, they were blowing us off the park. <laughs> they, they just were playing the perfect game. I've never seen them play that well. I've never seen any team play that well. Just so smooth. And I, Richie stepped me on one of the plays and then came back around and threw like, made a little break and threw like a 20 meter flat cut pass. And I was running next to him. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and he looked at me like, what the? <laughs> I was like, I was like, that was good. Yeah. I was like, man, that was slick. And he's looking at me like, well, I'm playing. You were like, bro. I can, yeah. yeah I, like, I can genuinely appreciate it still. And that's not going to stop me from wanting to chop him and smash him. And literally, then me take my game to the next level. It was inspiring to see how much they were just playing in the moment how much they were like of single mind. It wasn't like there was 10 different moving parts. It was like they were all just flowing together. And I was like, that really inspired me to, well, to try and take my game to the next level. And I believe I, I am beginning to. Oh, well, listen, if your performance last week is, uh, <laughs> you know, they say in this sport, you're only as good as your last game. Mm. That was a, it was a fantastic. Might retire. Yeah, 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 it was good. I, no, I, but... That was one of my favorite games I played. It was just, we finally just got the attack sinking. It'd been a, a tough start to the season. We Obviously, three wins from three, three from three, but felt like we were all on sort of different pages and we really went back to the drawing board. Like last week of all weeks with the floods going on and we only had one session together, but we really just broke it down mm. and reinvented our attack. Nothing crazy, but just little, little glimpses here, glimpses there, and then it just allowed me to just move on the field and guys hitting good lines and, it, yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah, man, and you were – it was it was a clinic, but also underneath that, it was it was watching your mastery, you know. And I think you know whether it's your kicking practice that I know you've been doing with your coach, and just the discipline of like time and time and time and time and even more time. Yeah. You know, it's not just for the the World Cup winning kick; it's actually for those moments like last week. Yeah, you know, when life actually matters, when your state is going through extreme trauma. And you know that that little moment of, you know, 90 minutes that they can watch and you bring up their spirits, you know, that's yeah. the higher purpose, and, I think, in this. Yeah. yeah, and that is where I feel is my higher purpose. Exactly what we're talking about, that consistency is what pulled me out of the whole before, say, before all this stuff and what has been the solid one was watching these guys at the top of their game. Even like, even outside of sporting industries, guys who are literally just, you can see they trust themselves and they like, you can buy into like what they're doing you can have faith in these guys because they're they are just so solid and that's where i want to get to is week in week out not just on the field off the field like wherever it is in my life i'm being authentic and I'm, i literally turn up and yeah it's taken hours and hours of practice like i started working when i got back to australia and i ended up moving it to 10 like after the world cup i was a bit disappointed because i felt i didn't have the impact on the game that i wanted so like I moved into 10, like by chance as well, our our young 10 got injured and then I moved in there and I was like, okay, now I'm, I'm here. How do I stay here? And it was like, well, where do I need? I had a hard look at myself and I was like, well, where do I need to improve? And I'm like, well, I'm kicking like a lemon. So <laughs> that's number one. I need to improve my kicking. I need to improve my support lines. I need to improve my connection. So it was all, I literally was really hard on myself and I went back to the drawing board and, and it was like, I'm not just going to get good at these things. I want to master these things. I don't want people to be like, oh, he's a 10, you know, but he, you know, he can't kick. Like I wanted to master these things. So Dave Aldred actually got stuck out in Australia with COVID. So it was another beautiful, like divine, Thank you, universe. divine connection there. Yeah. yeah. So I worked with him three times a week and just broke apart my kicking game, which was, um, another part that was tough on my ego mm. it was, yeah, like it was, it was cause I'd kicked for the Wallabies, won yeah. games for the Wallabies through my goal kicking, started working with him and he's like, no, nah, no. Nah. He's like, no wonder why you're getting injured. Like, your techniques here, this, that. You're trying too hard. He's like, you literally smash at everything. He's like, we got to get some flow into mm. your kicking. He's like, when you play on the field, like when you're passing, he's like, you're smooth, you're balanced, you're like, you're manipulating defenders with your shoulders, with your eyes. You're loose. So why aren't you doing that when you're kicking? Stop trying so hard. So we rebuilt my technique, and yeah, hours and hours. I'd go at home, I had a little soccer ball, kick it against the wall. 
put a mattress up against the wall. Yeah, my missus would be like, mate, just stop. <laughs> Please. Be like, they should be in the backyard. I should catch him as well. So oh, no. she's, yeah, she's been huge for me. You know, oh, for mate. You, yeah, you, you, your yang's only as big as your, your partner, you know. If she wasn't, hadn't flourished and hadn't done the internal work that she's done, it's incredible watching her journey as well. Like mm. I'm in the, I guess, in the public eye, so people see my journey, but her journey is even deeper than mine. So I, I aspire to like the connection that we have and the, the growth I've seen in her has inspired me to go to the next level. And the communication we have now mm. is just incredible where we can just break apart scenarios. It's genuinely a partnership. That's really special to hear because it's very rare to hear people speak about their partners with such respect mm. and admiration as well. And I think coming back to something that you said earlier around the fear of feeling, mm. you know, I yeah. think what the feminine does so extraordinarily well is feel. And, you know, I think I know inside of my relationship, that's where I get a lot of inspiration and often in awe at just witnessing the power to be, to feel, to not try and control. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, it's special. So shout out to all the incredible, powerful women out there. What you're feeling is you, yeah, you're meant to feel it. It's okay. Mm. It's like just because it's not a joyful experience. Some of them are like, he sees musicians, some of the best albums are written and, and done through pain yeah like pain is a motivating a driving factor you're in pain you want to get the hell out of it that's like don't like mask it don't busy yourself like feel it and let it fuel you and that was yeah that was a huge learning for me as well it's like if i wake up and i'm not in the best mood so who cares so what like just get to work feel what where you're at and understand why you're in that position why am i feeling this way Ah, because I've, there's something in the back of my mind. Like there's something on my to-do list that I'm not facing. There's something in my equation, putting everything on James O'Connor, all my daily routines, this, that, all my relationships. There's something in the equation there that's off and that's making me, well, that's causing me to feel this certain way. Don't skip over it. Sit with it and figure out what it is. And then as soon as you, you know, recommit to it, as soon as you heal it, it's like, bang, you move up another octave and it's like, Wow, like if I hadn't sat with that feeling, it could have been weeks before I'd, you know, actually realized where I was at. Yeah, and I think the the more we sit and the more we feel, and I think even inside of that, the more we feel the parts of ourselves that we've shamed the most, mm. the more whole we become. Yeah. You know, I know that's been a massive journey for me is instead of numbing, pushing away, suppressing, actually sitting with those feelings and the masculine inside of me was like, I got to go get them. I got to go stop feeling like that. Yeah. As soon as I just have slowed yeah. down and learn a practice to just serve those feelings or serve those parts myself, I literally have a personal practice where I like slow down and I literally speak to the parts of myself Never. and listen to them. And what that has done to clean up my internal world, my conscious world but also made me way more present, way less yeah. triggered in the world. Yeah. Because often when I find I'm getting triggered by shit out externally, it's because of something internally that it reminds me of that I have embarrassment or shame about. Yeah. And it's often something that's happened as a kid, yeah, you yeah. know? It lost so many of the things can go back to literally what's happened as a kid, like that conditioning. And yeah, that, well, that's the balance of that yin and yang, right? Being able to sit with yourself, not always just going out there. Because if you're always just a bull at a gate, that's force. You can't last. You're eventually going to burn out. Whereas when you can sit with yourself and yeah, every part of you is conscious, right? It's all like, it's all listening. It's all interpreting. I think that's, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Mm, I love that, man. I want to go back to your partner. Her name is Bridget. Bridget. So the journey for you two, I'm sure on many fronts would just be an insane life experience to have a partnership, the journey that you guys have gone on to, you know, to kind of go from being like the pinup couple where that was what you guys got rewarded for. That's what you were seen yeah, for. Yeah. That's what you were the known illusion, for, yeah. the illusion. But then to also go on your own journey now through your own healing practices, your own per like discovering your purpose together, but then also doing it in partnership mm. is its own journey in of itself. Yeah. Um, how has it been for you? Yeah. Well, without, don't want to share too much on, uh, on her story. Okay. She can share that. But from my, like, from my thing, the first, like, we've known each other since we were 15. So it's been a, we've, whether we came into this life agreeing to that, whatever, however you want to call it, 
but yeah, we've grown together. There's we've grown apart, we've grown together. There's there was huge, huge things that um like we had to work through for, for sure, like any other relationship. But I'd like in the state I was, I'd yeah, I'd done so many things that I regretted and had shame for and guilt about and and we work through those things, you know, as as you can do if you if you literally just drop your ego and put it all to the side and you're like, fuck, this is where I was at. This is what I've done. Like, can we move forward with it? And then it's whether they can or not. Instead of like just trying to make things work, it's like, you know, fresh start, clean slate. And that's sort of where we got to. But um, from my point of view, it was like, you have to be sovereign. Not have to, have to. It's like a you limiting word. It's like, yeah, you choose to be sovereign. Mm. Individuals, you choose your own world. And then with that, then you choose to come together. If you're living for each other, that's when things get a bit codependent, a bit icky, and which I found, which we found in our relationship as well. And that was the thing. As soon as we both chose to, you know, live for ourselves and literally create the reality that we wanted within ourselves, then when we came back together, which is so empowering because you know, we're keeping each other accountable, we're, we're building a world together and we have the same, not, not values, but we have the sort of the same goals and the same mindset and, at the end of the day, we both want to do good in this world. As soon as if that's where you want to get to, everything else is almost lining up within it and you're going to be moving in, this, in sync. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard something early days in when I was probably early 20s around which described, I think, what you're saying, which is some relationships end up like an A. So you're connected, but then your paths diverge into one and that's where things get icky. Mm. But another dynamic is that they're just like an H. So you're still going on your sovereign paths, but you are connected. And yeah. I think for me, that's, it's profound, you know, yeah. because it's, it's not the Hollywood narrative or the fairy tale existence yeah, it we're isn't. told. Yeah. It happily ever after and you ride off into well, the sunset. Yeah. Well, space is good as well. And yeah, if she wants to go and do this for a few weeks. Great. And empower her to do that. If that's where your heart's taking you. Cool. It's when you'll feel like, yeah, you see the Hollywood things and it is so, it's like a needy love. It's that Hollywood love, but is that really, is that real love? Love is like pure. It's unconditional. It's like what is best for their world and what do they choose? Whereas if you're always in each other's space, like it's that code, of, it's that codependent. It's like, well, you know, I'm going out to work and, but I got to get home because she expects me home or this, or you, know, you need to make dinner because that's the agreement we had and this and that. And that's when, it's like, hey, are you living for yourself or are you living for them? And are you actually even living for them? Or are you just, it's a scenario in your head. Of your mind has created this loop. It's like, these are my tasks and this is how we are. And this is what we do. And this is my identity. My identity is now him as well. It's not just, my identity isn't just James O'Connor. It's the blurred of this person, this person, this person. And that's the sum of my parts together. It's uh yeah it's a, we could go we could go a lot further on that but yeah I think yeah the biggest thing for us was literally just finding our own path and then yeah choosing to come back together every day choosing each day to better ourselves and and choosing our partner I love that man and it I think coming back to there's just clearly trust there there is mm. just a, a foundation of trust that had to be earned but the trust in other being away or not in immediate sight but that you come back and you choose. Yeah. Like the, the, the daily choice is so profound and so powerful because for me, in my experience, relationship is a skill. You know, mm. intimacy is a skill. You have to be vulnerable, right? And that's such a scary word, right? And it almost gets thrown around. Like, oh, you just got to be vulnerable. Like when you are truly vulnerable, it is the scariest fucking thing in the yeah. world. It, literally, in my experience, it feels like the – like all the things that I've been scared about in my life come down to this moment. I'm like, I'm never going to get love again. I'm going to get abandoned, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. 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 But do, do you feel that once you have that faith to be vulnerable, then it's like, then it feels like you're just, it's a warm hug around you. It's, once you've like not committed to it, but once you've actually just accepted it, then it's like, Oh wow. Like anything from now is it's, it's bliss. It's, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Like I had abused her trust many times in the past and, so I, I know what it's like to not have trust for someone else because I didn't trust myself. Mm. And so to flip that, uh, yeah, it's a it's a, an amazing feeling when you can just like when you just know, you just know like whatever happens, you're you're protected, you're looked after, and you have someone in your world that has your best interest at heart and will go, like not go to war for you, but will literally, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, 
you know, often I hear this described in the kind of the masculine circles, but if you spiritually bleed with someone, there is a bond there that is otherworldly. Yeah. And, and I think often if relationships are resilient enough and people do their own work inside of those relationships, then that's a possibility that can happen. Yeah. And it is work. Yeah. That's the, the key word is like you said, it's a skill. It is work. You got to turn up like, I don't have a perfect relationship at all. Like we quarrel often. But because we communicate, yeah, we can get to the bottom of things. It's not like me versus you. It's a hey, what's the outcome here? Like, what? Where's the blockage coming? Do you need a little bit of space? Do I need a little bit of space? Like, go like figure it out. Because a lot of the time, it actually isn't the relationship. It's something that's being blocked in myself that I'm not happy with that I've done to myself. That then I'm taking out on someone else. Yeah, it all comes back to your inner world. Absolutely. And the ego is so convincing in making it external. <laughs> well, you, did yeah. this and you did that. And I remember back in 2003 when <laughs> you said, right. like, right. man, okay. what is the outcome you want yeah. here? <laughs> That's right. And let's just slow everything down. Yeah. And if we actually feel, um, often we can get to the source of what yeah. is the discomfort and, or the trigger. And it's not me beating you. Like, yeah, no totally, one wins. Totally. It's not, it's you're looking for the win-win outcome. Mm. Let's just drop the ego, drop being right. You don't have to be right. Like, I, that was one thing. I never used to be able to apologize. Like, I'd say sorry, but it wasn't, like, yeah. heartfelt because I was like, no, I can't do any wrong. Like, then I'm admitting then then my whole life is a lie. And then as soon as I was like, yeah, I fucked up. Yeah, my bad hair there. Like, started being able to just be honest in my world. It was, like, freeing. It was, like... Every time was like a layer dropping yeah. off me, like a weight dropping off me. And it was like, it's beautiful, like being able to just genuinely be like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, look, I stuffed up there. That's not the highest version of myself, but I'm not making it wrong. Yeah. It's just that was where I was at and I made a decision to do that. And yeah, look, I, I apologize for that. And let's, let's move, let's move forward from there. Oh, man. And just like acknowledging the impact, taking responsibility and committing to something going yeah. forward. Committing to something going forward. Man, it's just not taught, you know? And it's like, I really want to, like what you said there around, um, if I admitted I was wrong, then I'd have to admit so much of my life was wrong. Yeah. You know, that's the clog, right? Yeah. Because then the, the damn wall of all the feelings that I've been suppressing, now yeah. started, I've pulled it out. Yeah. I'm fucked, you know? Dominoes. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. But then it's often, you know, the hardest, that's the hardest bit, that beginning, just getting that muscle working. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you know, to your point, not attaching identity to failure is so important, you know? And again, I'm not taught that, like, I took this action and it didn't get the outcome I wanted. That's a really powerful way to talk about it. But I failed or that's my error. Even the attachment of language, I failed. Language, huge, huge language man, is like how we make sense of the world, right? Yeah. You know, little bean up, bean up brains trying to conceptualize everything and the limited language we have. And I often find this with particularly English language, which is like so limited in expression. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, you know, I, I got an old friend and she ran a, a not-for-profit, which was called Mayabuya, which is a Zulu word, which means bringing back something that was once lost. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I wish we had words like that. Yeah. And like, even I just get mesmerized by that word. Yeah. I'm like, English <laughs> attempt at that is just yeah. so poor. Our, yeah. <laughs> Our language is quite limiting. Yeah. We talk about babble. Mm. Like, a lot of, even especially in Australia, the way we communicate, it's so like, it's always negative. Like, how are you? Not bad. Yeah. Like, it's, like, it's incredible. You change one word, two words, your whole cells come alive. Like your whole body responds in a different way. Like your mind is listening to everything. Your body's listening everything. to everything. If you're speaking neg negatively about yourself or your situation, it's going to take that as a reality. Even if you're joking, like one of the, I did like a, oh, a sort of a, a course of sorts in, in, in language. Cause I was just really interested in body language as well. Like every time you touch every little injury you have, it's all related to literally can be emotions or situations. It was incredible finding out this, this knowledge about, in terms of like language, like when you say like, I want, you're already going outside of yourself. When mm. I have to, you don't have to, like you're already going outside yourself. You're a victim, you're in lack. I must, instead of like that word choosing, mm. it, you change a few little things yeah. and automatically now you're in the driver's seat instead of you being the victim, like, oh, he made me do that. And she said this and uh, I have to, I have to win I the Super Rugby this. this year. Like I must, like, uh, or I, I really want to. It's like you're a victim or you're putting so much pressure on yourself. Whereas 
you change a few key words, like you can go so much, like this course took me so much deeper into to language, but just changing a few of those little words to put myself in the driver's seat and empower myself changed so much of my outlook on life and of my day. Mm. And I watched you do it just before. You know, you caught yourself and went, you know, you have to do this. And you go, no, 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 I get yeah. to choose to do this. Yeah. And it, I think, as you said, the interesting thing for me is, again, you said this, consciousness is always listening and watching and mm. feeling. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when we put these words or this language, which we're not even conscious we're doing, it's a different type of conscious, um, it's sending messages to how we treat ourselves yeah. and our, how we treat ourselves is often how we treat the external world as well. Yeah. And I think something which is very interesting right now is how we have treated the planet is often how we've, um, in my, this is my opinion, how we've treated the planet is how we've treated the internal feminine world in us as men, you know? And I just think there's a lot of healing that is about to take place and it's not necessarily going to be like clean healing. It's, it's going to be feeling a lot of things and really looking at how we've treated what we've done, what we've done. And, and that, that's a huge, the huge thing of a breakthrough. It's not just all kumbaya and you know, it's gentle and whatnot. Like the feminine could be harsh as well. It could be literally like impactful, brutal, like, they're yeah. powerful beings in, in a way that pierces through the masculine bullshit. Yeah, literally. Yeah. yeah, that that just banging your head against the wall. like, no, you sit with what you've done mm. and you feel it. You feel everything you've done. Yeah, literally. And but if you do, if you have the courage to do that, then you come out the other side and it's that's it. Yeah, bliss. That's it, man. And it comes back to what we we're saying before around the vulnerability, right? It's like it's once you choose to fall. Yeah you actually realize we're always falling. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's the biggest yeah. joke about the whole thing. But in the falling, so enjoy is, it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. How do you learn to paraglide? You know, mm. like that's it. And, and I think there's a lot of lessons we can take from the feminine people in our lives as to how we can do that better. Yeah. So, mate, fatherhood. Um, I'm curious around the models of fatherhood that you've been exposed to and then how is that shaping your journey for if you are choosing to be a father, whenever that may be. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. What, what's How do you think about fatherhood based on the models you've inherited versus the man you are becoming and are now? Yeah, I haven't really thought about this one <laughs> too much. Um, in terms of like, I think from what I said at the beginning, actions is everything. Yeah. Like whether it's a son or a daughter, they want to see you walking the walk, not just talking the talk, but actually walking it. And f- for me as well, what I've really realized is everything is relationships. Everything you touch is relationships. So if I want to have a, a relationship with my son or my daughter where we can just communicate openly. They can come to me for anything. And that's a bit lip service, like easier said than done. But I think as soon as you take yourself away from that, I'm the teacher, you're the student, as soon as you can literally, because there's so much you can learn from a child as well yeah, totally. before they've had all the conditioning of, this is the way you do it in the world. Go to school for eight hours. Like, that's a, a, an issue with our, you know, Western society is we put the mind as like, you know, we celebrate someone having like such a, a powerful mind when it's actually the heart or the gut mm-hmm. or the soul, which is the actual, the most powerful thing. That's your intuition. Your intuition then can guide your mind. Your mind's almost like, someone said to me, it's like, your mind's like the robot. It's almost like it's, all your conditioning, all your circumstances, yeah. all your experiences put together, your mind literally pulls them all up and then creates the best model for survival. How do I survive in this situation, this situation, this situation? As soon as you leave that box of survival and it's like the thrival and, hey, what's coming to me? What am I actually feeling? Where am I going in the world? That's when you can start playing with ideas and, and really enjoying it. So, yeah, going back on fatherhood, for me it's just – open conversation it's time you put time into something like put time into my kicking it starts to work put time into my relationship it starts to work you put time into your children hey i haven't done it yet Mm. so i'm I'm not trying Mm. to preach about anything Mm. but if you put time and you genuinely you know you respect that person not as that's a miniature me and i'm going to push them into this area this area like they're their own being they've come Mm. here for their own experience (laughs) so allow them to Mm. experience what they're choosing then oh, I'm, I'm sure it would be such an amazing experience and I think the world would be in a much, much 
much better place. Yeah, I agree completely. And what I take out of that is deeds, not words, being mm-hmm. present. And then also, you know, very simply where your attention goes, the energy flows is yeah. the best way to summarize yeah. that. Attention and is everything, right? That's it, man. And if you choose to bring a child into the world, like your life is, it's still about you, but now it is about your child. You've made that decision to bring another life. Like your, your, your wife is created, <laughs> like created life. How, how amazing is that? And now you're there staring, like staring this child's life. You're, who are they going to look to? Like for the first 20 years of your life, like your dad's your hero yeah. and you're literally mimicking everything they do. So that's what I mean. Choosing, if you're going to choose that path and I, I believe I will choose that in the future. Once I do though, it's going to be about my child and literally giving them the best platform for them to grow as they see fit. Not as where I'm, oh, I want you to be. He's, I want you to be a rugby player yeah. and follow my footsteps. Hey, you do what you came here to do. Yeah, I love that. And I'll support that. For me, the reason I ask that is I think fatherhood and and fathering, not just even of your own children, Mm. but that concept of the fatherly energy is so missed in society. And, you know, I think the World Health Organization, I remember put out a report saying one of the biggest challenges in the world is the lack of present fathers Mm. for a variety of reasons. And we see a lot of trauma be transferred to children from a lack of healthy adult role models for boys particularly or not just boys any kid on the gender spectrum you know i just i just i'm always encouraged like i want to hear people talk about fathering more because i hear there's a lot of like support groups around mothers and but for dads it doesn't seem to be as like prolific yeah and i think we we go out into the workforce we got to go out right mom's in charge of like holding the family together but yeah it's a it's a joint job you know when you have that balance I'm, I'm, i'm i'm sure that there'd be a nice little synchronicity there. Yeah. He said like there was some crucial moments with my dad and with my mom. Yeah. Like they were both like they're human. So they're both flawed in in certain areas, but they did instill some beautiful things in me that when the time came, when I actually was down and out, I could recall on a few of these teachings and learnings and things that I had seen to help get myself out of trouble or pull myself out of here or there. Like you say, like with fatherhood, like if you – like maybe that's the issue is like if you didn't have like a father who was as hands-on because he may have been working, you know, 12 hours a day or whatnot, then that's what you see and then you replicate what you see, right? But that's how we learn. That's like the conditioning. That's the experience we've had. That's it. So what does it take to sort of bring that more into balance a little bit? And I, Absolutely. I think one of the big insights for me was – actually the things that I got hurt from my parents, from them doing something. And also let's just slow down. Being a parent is a fucking hard job. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, you say one thing and your kid remembers <laughs> it forever. You don't say a thing. They remember, remember that it, forever. Yeah. Oh. And you can't <laughs> like just, holy shit. Um, well, let alone, you know, you come games. home from work and then you're tired and oh, yeah, you know, another life form depends I on you. I from rugby I'm like, I don't know how like some parents literally work two jobs or just work a job, come home, cook dinner are there present with their kids and literally like spend, you know, sit at the dinner table. Yeah, the, the first thing you'd want to do is like, oh, mate, just go on the PlayStation, you know, go do your thing with your brothers or, or whatnot. But to actually, yeah, be able to sit there, like it, it's, it is, it's a full-time job. Full-time job. I mean, like when you're choosing to have a child, like it, it is, it's, it's full-time. <laughs> you're in. Also, the game is like, the game we're taught to play and the game we are playing is, mm. is flawed. It's like, in the world, like in my perfect world, you wouldn't go out and work that much. You wouldn't be away from your family that much. You know, it, it would be shared between, you know, your wife and, you know, your husband would share the duties of, of raising a child. And also it wouldn't be like the goal here is to make money. It's like, hey, we that's fuel to fuel our life so we can, you know, enjoy it and live that's instead it. of like us being caught in that rat race where, we always need more. We need a bit more. And there's school fees. Now there's this. Now we want to send them to a sports camp. You know, there's all, always more in that in the back of your back of your mind. Like I could feel with my dad, three kids all going to sort of private schools and him wanting the best for us. Like he'd work himself to the bone. So when he'd get home, he was fatigued, mm. you know, and then that can go move into your relationship. Then he doesn't have any energy not to put into us. But what about his partner, my mum? then, you know, that relationship doesn't get as much energy as it should. And then everything sort of falls out of sync a little bit there. And then maybe my mom goes and does a part-time job and then she's not spending as much time with us as well. So it's like 
the game's rigged because it, it's all about you yep. know being working a nine to five and us making more money. Uh, eventually, you realize like it's so hard to get out of that rat race. So why not use their game against them and just be content with the smaller things? Easier said than done. But instead of like just striving to like try and get to the next level, the next level, the next level. Yeah. What do you do when you get that extra money? You upgrade your car a bit. Maybe you upgrade your house to an extra room or a bit closer to the beach. But at the end of the day, like it's yeah. What are you going like, to be the richest person in the graveyard? Yeah, you know, hundred percent. And then you yeah. take away that. Well, you see all these these kids that come from sort of really really wealthy families. They some of them have the big hard like toughest issues because they've been given everything at such a young age. So they don't know how to work for things, but also like they've been neglected in terms of care, in terms of like time spent with them. And then, you know, they get into these, these sort of poor habits. But yeah, at the end of the day, part of the experience of a, of a child coming through as well is for them to make their own mistakes and them to actually have to earn some of that money, some of that energy, that fuel to create their own life. Otherwise, they will have no, like, how do you know what money's worth if you've always had it? How do you know what it feels like to actually have to work a tough job, the shit job, when you've always had it? Like, that was one thing with me. Like, I was very protective because I went straight out of school started playing professional rugby and started earning good money at a young age. So I didn't even know the value of money. Like I'd throw it here, there, everywhere, pay for this, pay for that. And even like little things like when I was younger, like given my brothers, I had a house there that I'd sort of, a house on the Gold Coast that I'd, I didn't live there, but I'd sort of be in Perth, come home, that they lived in and like rent free and stuff like that. But that took away mm. an experience for them to actually have to know what it was like for them to hustle and earn to be able to pay rent and to put, you know, pay the bills and put food on the table. I thought I was doing a good thing, but eventually I was starving them of that experience, which we found out later and we all had a good little laugh about it and a chat about it and stuff. So it's like, instead of me working myself to the bone to give my child a better life, cool, like that's a great thing to do, wanting to give them another, a better life. But also it's that balance as well of you need to look after yourself too because your child is seeing what you're doing. So if you're neglecting yourself, they're going to get into that pattern too and start neglecting themselves physically, maybe not eating correctly because you've, you're time poor. So you're getting takeaway food often or you're always just, you know, microwave meal or whatnot. They're seeing that and then they'll replicate it as they get older. It's absolutely right. They mimic what they see. Yeah. You know, you can give them the best advice in the world, but it's what they what see. What see, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, coming back to this narrative of like – you know, I heard this described really well recently around generational wealth versus generational wisdom. Yeah, well, wow. you know, and that's that's a really interesting dichotomy because we are sold the again. We come back to this like consumerism narrative of like get the next best, get the yeah. upgrade. Get the know? upgrade, yeah. It's always <laughs> you know the, the next shiny thing. Opposed to now what is in this class? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Opposed to what is the character of the person? What is the character of my child? How am I acknowledging them? Am I saying, hey, James, like you played a great game on the weekend. You're a good boy. Or am I saying, hey, James, I really noticed the kindness that you showed when you walked in and you said hi to everyone. Yeah. You know, I really noticed that when someone shared something, you went over to them and just said, hey, good job. Yeah. You know, so what are you validating inside of the young people, all the people in your lives? Yeah. Because I think that's, if we can start rewarding behavior and letting people know you see them when they are at their best self, that just brings more. Yeah. And then the loop continues. Yeah, I feel you. Nice, man. Well, dude, I just want to say a massive thank you. You know, I feel like we dipped into another world there. <laughs> we um, but I'm yeah. Strong. Yeah. yeah. Um, bit of a vortex. Eh? A bit of a vortex. But it's been really special to just cover some pretty diverse territory with you. You know, and I think, you know, you've, you're a busy guy. You've gone from one promotion to another appointment, but you've, you know, you've squeezed this in and this, you know, we, we work both at Man Cave and at Stuff with, you know, thousands of young men. And, you know, I think what you going out of your way to do this, to provide, you know, your insights, your story, you know, the struggles, the lessons that the wisdom that you're bringing back is really special, man. And I just want to say again, like, I want to honor your internal journey. Yeah. Everything you went through, you know, the sadness, the tears, the addiction, the depression, all of that pain. I can even feel my body now, man. It's just really inspiring. So I just want to say thank you for doing that and thank you for coming back and just being a role model. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And that part of my journey coming back was to be able to share this, not in a way like you do this, you do that, but just in a, a genuine way of, hey, there is another way to live 
to live life. You don't have to follow everything they've told you. You know, you need the money, you need the women, you need power. Like that's a game I played and I got all those things. And I was the more I got of that, the less fulfilled I was internally, the more I lost myself. It was like I said, it, it destroyed me trying to play that game that society's taught you to play. There's so the the real path is like you said that that oneness when you realize like we're all we are a community like I'm here to share and we're you know we're all brothers and sisters and it's a beautiful thing when you can actually rely on people and have trust and there's all the knowledge in the world someone actually someone actually um, one of my teammates Samu um, <laughs> had a little a funny thing between knowledge and wisdom he said uh, knowledge is knowing tomatoes are fruit. Wisdom is knowing you don't put in a fruit salad. Okay. <laughs> yes, sometimes, so. you know, sometimes you get that knowledge. It's so available yeah. on social media and stuff, but then living it, like having those experiences and then being able to share it from a place of knowing, not knowing, but mm. not knowing from your mind and understanding the concept, but genuinely knowing is, it's an awesome thing. So yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully this is going to touch a few people. Thanks, mate. Cheers, bro.